success was very a very recent thing for us and that was the first time that we'd ever played a song and then suddenly you could hear people singing it back it was really crazy feeling actually the volume with which people sang the words back quite intimidating actually because i just thought what if i forget the words and everybody will know that had never been a problem before nobody knew what any of our songs were Hello, I'm Jarvis Cocker, author of Good Pop, Bad Pop, and I'm here to react to some of my supposedly iconic moments. Shall we have a look? Pulp performance and interview from 1984. I'm, I'm impressed that someone has unearthed this. So this is this was shot in the garage next to our house in, in Sheffield. We were very excited at the time. It was some people from the university were making a documentary about local music. We decided, oh yeah, we've got to go to town. This is going to be the first time we've ever been filmed. So we got lots of toilet roll from the, the shop down the road and, and draped it all round inside the garage. And you can maybe see that we, we got some coloured plastic to put in front of various lamps to give us a bit of a lighting effect. And uh, actually, it doesn't sound too bad. Yeah, we, was, we were really excited and so then we said to them, oh can we, because they filmed like two or three songs and we wanted to use that as a video and then uh, they'd only been able to afford to buy one videotape so they'd, they'd already recorded over it for the next interview that they'd done so that was a bit, we were slightly crestfallen by that but let's see what happens. So you have to rely on a certain number of pubs which are usually quite small. Um, and well, I, first thing I can see it, tell you is I, my voice has dropped about an octave since this uh, video was made. Interesting hair I've got going on there, similar beard. Uh, so this is the band all sat around the back of my mum's house uh, on the patio there with the dog. And they, they were asking us about conditions. I mean, basically, if you were in a band at that time in Sheffield in 1985, you were kind of the lowest of the low. They, they, you weren't really... It was just about basically saying you were a social security scrounger, you know, you couldn't get a proper job so you were in a band. It wasn't a respected occupation. And not very good, or you have to get to the colleges <laughs> and universities. <laughs> just stick bands in because they think bands can put up with anything and it didn't really matter if they get electrocuted and die. Because <laughs> they're all social security scroungers anyway. <laughs> I don't know whether I really believed that at that time, but it, it was my... I'm still marvelling at the accent, actually, it's quite strange. You could never use for anything else, things that are falling to pieces. I don't usually make any notes before we play, because I think that you should always be spontaneous on stage. Right, well, that, well, I'm talking about don't make no. Well, that's, I really believe in that, that you shouldn't make notes. It's really disappointing when somebody says the same thing in between songs every night, and it's dispiriting. I believe that you should just say what's going through your head at that point. Sometimes you just say rubbish, but whatever. But in this case, because stepping up to play at Glastonbury was such a massive leap for us, because people probably know this, but you know, we weren't supposed to be headlining on Saturday. It was just because John Squire of the Stone Roses had had an accident on his bike and they had to pull out and we got kind of called while we were in the studio recording, actually. We had to stop recording and, and go off and play. Common people, the record had been a hit only like three or four weeks before so all this kind of stardom thing was was a real new thing to us so basically all that it's a long way of saying I was shitting myself and I was nervous so I made some notes actually in case I just got overwhelmed by the occasion you know what do I actually say let's see oh, yeah, I think you should come on and be in the yeah no, I've just said that I've just said that thank you um, but uh, I did find this note actually in the loft. It's not in this in the book because I haven't got to that part of my life yet. But yeah, I was amazed that I found it. And see, you know, we come on here and you're there, and we do our thing and we see what you make of it, and then it comes back to us and it's something that happens, right? I mean, it seems like I'm very relaxed there, but I'm not. I mean, I'm amazed. My recollection of this concert is of complete terror. I mean, especially in the time before going on stage, I remember sitting and, and holding on to the chair that I was sitting, and I just sat on this chair for like two hours before going on stage, just in case if I got up, I might trip over something or whatever. Um, K 
carrots, potatoes, peas. Oh, no, so let's finish off the list now. If you want something to happen enough, then it actually will happen. OK. Yeah, well, this is my motivational speech, I suppose. If you want something... Yeah, well, that's true. You know, by this point of 1995, you know, Pulp had already existed for 12, 13 years. When I first moved down to London at the end of the 80s, I thought that was the end of the group. You know, it was my kind of childhood, teenage dream, and I'd, I'd tried it after leaving school, and it didn't work out. So I, it had been a long time coming, and, and at many points in that, I'd thought it was never going to happen. But I always could never give up on that dream. Yeah, it eventually came true. I don't know if that happens every time. So I guess that's what I was trying to say. I probably said it more articulately back then. In fact, that's why we're stood on the stage today after 15 years. Because we wanted to try for you know I mean? so, You're going to so play a song then, or what? Are you just going to stand there talking all night? Right, 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 right. And then, so we eventually played the song. Then that was very moving, actually, because, that, as I say, success was very, a very recent thing for us, and that was the first time that we'd ever played a song and then suddenly you could hear people singing it back. It was a really crazy feeling, actually, the volume with which people sang the words back. Uh, quite intimidating, actually, because I just thought, what if I forget the words and everybody will know? That had never been a problem before. So it was, yeah, it was a, it was a big moment for us. Do you remember the first time? That's a song of ours. That's uh, maybe I will remember it. I don't know. Yeah, I was quite proud of this video. I mean. The video was made by Pedro Romani, but because I came down to London to study film, I had made some of the band's early videos and, and still had quite a hand in them. This being a case in point, because this technique that you can see, where the camera is kind of dipping above the horizon and then coming back down, um, I have to say, is, is shamelessly stolen from an experimental filmmaker that I discovered whilst at college. Maybe now is the time to apologise to him. Tony Hill, Downside Up, please watch that film because it's superior to this video, but it did inspire this technique um, that you can see where it's, where it's, it's almost like action is taking place on both sides of a flat plane, and, and so you keep flipping like this and seeing, um, seeing what's happening kind of if you were living on a flat earth which by the way does not exist yeah this is i've not seen this video for a long time it's kind of uh, it's kind of nice to see it because this was the period quite soon after leaving college there was a club that we used to go to called smashing uh, which was on regent street and that's where most of the people that you see in the video were found from there. We just used to go there every Friday night and then we just went up to people who looked interesting and said, will you be in our video next week? And, and we, we made quite a lot of friends that way. And actually that's, and some of these magazines in this bit where I'm laid on this rug, I re-found again up in the loft. So I've had those uh, for, for, at least for, uh, going on for 30 years. <laughs> this is Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Are you ready for some real music? Come on! Quite a strange look. You've got, I think what you've got to remember when watching this is uh, I am supposed to be some kind of um, wizard entertainer. Not, this isn't an outfit I would wear as a muggle. I want to see your hands in the air! And there was a call went out for people to write songs for, for this scene, which is like where there's the Yule Ball at Hogwarts and the Weird Sisters, or whatever name they ended up in the end, are, are booked. And this is a very big deal because they're like the biggest band in, in the wizarding pop scene, if that exists. And, uh, and uh, we basically went to the, the film set near Watford and for three days just had people screaming at us as if we were the Beatles, you know, and played the song. And, and I should point out, so, 
I'm on vocals. My wizarding name was Myron Wagtail, I believe. And then the rest of the band, so we've got Johnny Greenwood on the guitar. There we go, look. I met Johnny Greenwood, but I didn't really know him. I mean, it's quite strange that's the only musical thing we've ever worked on together. Uh, um, I, I'm a great fan of his music, especially I, I like his film scores and stuff. My friend Jason, who's now in the Jarvis group with me, uh, and else, uh, he's playing the guitar. We've got Steve Mackey on the bass, Phil Selway of Radiohead also on the drums, and uh, Steve Claydon of Ad n 2 x on um, keyboard. So, you know, a super group, basically. <laughs> Anyway, this is a song that's called Do the Hippogriff. Um, Hippogriff is a mythical creature. Yeah, this, you know what, it was very good fun to do it and it made me very popular with the younger members of my family. Running the world. Did you hear? There's a natural order. It's funny, yeah, so I was wondering how you were going to present this song because it never got played on the radio because it's got a quite a major expletive in it. But we went over to uh, France uh, and played it on this TV show and they seemed absolutely fine with it. <laughs> so uh, that was good fun to do that. It's weird, it's like in, in, in the time, in the interim, it's kind of got a bit of a life of its own. I've heard it played at various marches and protests and stuff. The Indignados in, in uh, Spain, they had like a, a camp in, in Barcelona, it was played quite a lot. Uh, Extinction Rebellion things it's been played. The most recent thing was like there was a campaign to get it to number one about um, two years ago and um, it did quite well. Again, didn't get that much airplay but um, I keep hoping that I will stop playing this song. I often play it when live but unfortunately the world hasn't changed sufficiently for me to stop singing it so uh, it's still in the set list. Actually, you know, in, in the end you haven't got any say in whether you remembered or not, have you? I mean, that's the interesting part of it. Other people decide that. As I've found, you know, with writing my book and stuff, the things that stick in your mind or the things that you hold on to often surprise you. But if you were to say, I have made some potentially memorable things during my life, I would say thank you very much. Thanks for watching. You can get my new book, Good Pop, Bad Pop, by clicking the link in the description below. If you click over here, you can subscribe to Penguin for more videos like this.